you so much for coming and joining us virtually this afternoon. Um, we've got some K-12 educators, some university faculty who are interested in the topic, some students listening in. So we've got an exciting audience and group here with you all um, this afternoon. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know me, my name is Tara Acquia. I'm the K-12 Programs Coordinator for the Arkansas Center for Research and Economics at the University of Central Arkansas in Conway. So in my role, I get to hunt down really cool, interesting university professors who are researching and writing on cool topics. And that is where I was lucky enough to find our presenter for today, introduce Dr. Brian Albrecht assistant professor of economics at Kennesaw State University and chief economist at the International Center for Law and Economics. So he wrote a really cool Substack article about the Nobel winners that I read and said, hey, will you please come talk to our Arkansas teachers about this cool topic, give them some things to share. And he graciously agreed to join us today. As I said, I'm, uh, I'm Brian Albrecht. I'm the chief economist at the International Center for Law and Economics. I'm also at Kennesaw State. So I'm in a dual role doing policy work related to law and economics and, uh, and, and, you know, and a professor at the same time. I'm, I'm on leave technically this year. So I'm just doing policy work. Uh, last year, for those of you who came, you had Kevin Greer. Kevin is a, like a world renowned expert in the topic of the Nobel. I am not. I am an economics educator, first and foremost. Uh, I have my sub stack there where I write a uh, weekly newsletter for non-economists about economics. So hopefully I'm able to bring a little bit different perspective, uh, uh, but still something that that is informative. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about them as people, kind of where they fit into the profession. And then I'm going to focus in on first the work of that guy, Ben Bernanke, uh, and what he won the Nobel Prize for. And then it's really kind of a, a joint uh, prize between Diamond and Dibvig. Okay. So a little bit about them. If you recognize any of those three pictures, it's probably Ben Bernanke. Okay. He was born in 1953 in Augusta, Georgia. Had to, had to give a, a Georgia reference because that's where Kennesaw is at. That's where I taught for a few years. Uh, PhD from uh, MIT in 1979. MIT in the 70s is really kind of the the hallmark of economic theory and applied economics, Chicago and MIT, that's kind of where it was at. Okay. Most of his career was at Princeton. Okay. And there became this thing called the Princeton School of Macroeconomics, uh, which really focused on monetary economics, which is what Bernanke was, uh, won the Nobel Prize for eventually. If you know him, it's because in 2002, he joined the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. OK, or more particularly from 2006 to 2014, he was the chair of the Fed, the chair of the Fed board. So he's the one, you know, kind of directing all of, of monetary policy to the extent that it's a one person game. He's he's directing it. If we look at these years. Minor macroeconomic events straddled in there, the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. So he was in charge of the uh, of the Fed when this was going on. Okay, Now he's at Bro Brookings Institution uh, a as a research fellow there. Okay, Doug Diamond, second of the three Nobel Prize winners, again, 1953. One of the things about the Econ Nobel is it kind of, uh, in general, it's kind of progresses. It's for work done. 30 years ago. And so we'll see roughly the same age, roughly the same PhD. Okay. So unlike the sciences, where you have a breakthrough this year or a breakthrough last year, or, you know, a few years back, this is really for a career or for stuff that's held the test of time. Okay. From Yale. Uh, one of the interesting things about both Diamond and Dipfig was a lot of their papers that were cited, in particular, the big one that I'm going to talk a lot about, were from their dissertation. I, I'm not super optimistic that any of the papers in my dissertation are going to win me a Nobel, but it looks like it's already, you know, most of the work's already passed. So I think I lost my shot. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, his full career has been at the University of Chicago. That's one of the big uh, economic schools, most Nobel Prizes of, it, of any university. And now he's the Merton Miller uh, Distinguished Service Professor. Why do I give his title? Who cares? Merton Miller is another Chicago Nobel Prize winner for finance related field, uh, uh, Chicago kind of all the way down. Yeah. Dibvig, mid 50s, 
Yale, late seventies. You're kind of getting the the drift right now. Again, Nobel Prize. Now he's at St. Louis. Okay, he's been there for for a long time. Okay, so I said that uh, these that econ uh, Nobel is kind of given for a career's worth of of accomplishments. Okay, these are very three very uh, preeminent economists. One way to track this is to look at citations. This is citations from St. Louis uh, Fed ideas it's called it's a way they track these things and they have the top authors by numbers of citations okay um if we look at the very top andre schleifer no, not a nobel prize winner uh but he's number one heckman won the nobel prize again chicago angle i think yeah he won nobel prize fama stiglitz nobel prize okay near the top you get nobel prizes that's pretty common okay bernanke uh diamond and david are all have way more citations than I'll ever have, but they kind of fell into different spots. Bernanke, he is the highest ranking, 29th, okay? Another Nobel Prize winner, another Nobel Prize winner, one of my former professors uh, in, in Barcelona. Uh, equally big, if you're my professor, you want a Nobel Prize, that's kind of, that, those are kind of equal, uh, uh, of equal importance. Uh, you know, Bernanke had a career ma making lots and lots of papers, get lots and lots of citations. Okay, 24,000. That's, that's a lot of citations. Where Diamond, down here at 189, and Divvig, a lot fewer citations, mainly, again, around one paper. And actually, I, I dug into this a little bit. Um, of this 4,600, I think something like 4,300 of them are for the one paper I'm going to talk about with Doug Diamond. So I'm not trying to disparage Divvig, he won a Nobel Prize, that's wonderful, but he won a prize for one paper. That puts him in a league with just a few people. Uh, George Akerlof, which I'll talk about later, won for basically one paper. Bernanke, as I'm gonna focus on one of his papers, but he really established a career for about 30 years where he was just cranking out papers that got a thousand citations, a thousand citations, uh, kind of covering everything under the sun. So that's kind of where they're at. We got uh, we got a, a bunch of bold, no, not Phillips, not bold, a bunch of old white guys uh, getting the Nobel Prize this year. So what did they win for? Okay, forget the people. We're going to focus on uh, the actual ideas, the contributions here. Okay, they give a punchline on the on the Nobel before they give a one page summary, a three page summary, a seventy page summary. The short one-line summary is for research on banks and financial crises. Seems relevant. Uh, as I said, Bernanke was at the Fed during the oops for, during the financial crisis. What I'm going to go through the rest of the talk is kind of telling you more about what that means. Lots of people have done research on banks. Lots of people have done research on financial crises. What made their contributions unique? And what are the insights that I think you as economics educators should take away? Okay, um, so the way that I like to think about it, I'm going to continue making this distinction between Bernanke on one hand and Diamond Divvig on the other. Okay, and in econ, you can win the Nobel. Again, it's not for a breakthrough; it's for kind of a career. One way to think about it is you can win the Nobel for your contributions to a field. So I forget the year. Uh, Thomas Sargent, Chris Sims, they're they won the Nobel for their contributions to macroeconomics. That's what the, the one line sentence, this thing, that was what it said, to macroeconomics. Okay. People like Eleanor Ostrom, one of the two women to win the Nobel Prize, she won it for her work on governance, in particular work on governing of the commons. So there, there's a subject that she studied. She used experiments. She used uh, uh, she went out in the field, she ran regressions, she did all these things, she built, built formal models, but it was one area in which she got the country, uh, which she focused on. Amartya Sen, welfare economics. Okay, so that's one thing. You, you like hammer forward a field day in and day out for 30 years, 40 years, you make some contributions. The other is to give people tools. In economics, economists love tools that they can work with. And the people who select the Nobel Prize are economists, and they are interested in the same sort of methods or tools. So if you're here last year uh, for Kevin Greer's talk, uh, uh, it was on causal inference. How do you separate out causation for correlation? Carr, David Carr, Josh Ingress, and uh, Guido Imbens 
developed a bunch of statistical tools in which they could do that. So it wasn't, they mentioned that they got the Nobel for things related to labor, but really it was, here are tools, economists go and run with it. Economists get all excited when you give them fancy statistical tools. Paul Samuelson, same thing with mathematical models, game theory, um, if if you've seen A Beautiful Mind, John Nash, okay, that sort of thing. I mean, you guys aren't uh, aren't the first time you've seen a Venn diagram. There's a big open space here. There's some people are kind of in between. And I would put Milton Friedman, okay? He did stuff on a field, monetary economics, but he gave tools on which to work with that as well. Whoops, sorry. Bernanke, I'm going to say Bernanke, I don't think this is controversial. He just, his contribution was to the field of banking. I could say banking and financial crisis. Space will get a little, a little. A little tight here in the, in the Venn diagram. Where Diamond and Divvig, and I'm going to try to elaborate a little bit more of what I mean. Yes, it was on banking, but really what they contributed was a tool in which people working within banking could go and run with. And so, so I'm going to stress that. Okay. Uh, I'm used to giving academic talks in which people yell at me within a few minutes. So if you have questions, uh, send them in the chat or, or raise your voice. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it. Okay, so that's kind of putting them within uh, within the broader field. So let's talk about Ben Bernanke. Um, I really held back. There's a lot of good Bernanke memes. You can Google them. You can find them. I did not include any memes uh, to be among you know respectable people like yourselves. So we're gonna stick serious stuff. So Bernanke, I said he was the chair. A lot of people called him like the perfect chair. He was the right person to be the Fed chair for the 2008 financial crisis. He had spent his whole career writing on exactly the topic that was relevant, not just monetary economics, but the Great Depression specifically. Kind of the thing that in 2008, everyone was pointing to as the closest comparison, the Great Depression. This is what the guy spent his life doing. I mean, if you're going to be an academic who's working during another global financial crisis, this seems more relevant than I, I don't know. I, I have a, a I do some work on on game theory. That's not going to help you, right? He's he's the guy. Okay. And at this time, it's 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 a little bit unfair to say all of macroeconomics ignored uh, uh, money, but a lot of it really didn't think too seriously about monetary aggregates. We didn't think too seriously about money. It's a little bit weird. We can talk about it if people want. But as I said, Bernanke just. This is just selecting on 1990 to 2002 before he started in the Fed. You know, he's got just paper after paper. These are, these are, you can't compare these to the other numbers. These are, are a bigger set, but, uh, you know, paper after paper related to monetary economics. And so, you know, trying to elaborate what Bernanke got the Nobel Prize for, it's a little bit hard to boil it down. This is maybe a cop-out answer for me, but there's a ton of stuff. Uh, 13 papers are cited by the Nobel Prize uh, Committee. Things related to you know financial accelerator, things related to aggregate demand, all sorts of things. I'm not going to focus on them in this talk. I'm going to focus on kind of the one that made him the perfect chair in some sense. The one that really focused in on, on that is that's the Great Depression. So first order importance in question within monetary economics, what caused the Great Depression? Yeah. Um, if you look at high school history textbooks, now I don't think any, maybe there are some history teachers here. Um, if you're just econ, this won't be an issue. But about every 20 years or so, somebody writes a paper like this, which is high school textbooks versus uh, sorry, high, sp- high school textbooks of, of of the Great Depression versus the economics profession. And always, there's a paper in 85, there's a paper in 98. This one came out a month ago. And always, the takeaway is these history textbooks, the high school ones, are completely wrong in what they emphasize. Okay? Okay? They tend to ignore the recognized causes that the scientific, you know, not trying to be snooty with that term, but you know the academic literature has put forward. Okay, so if you look at high school textbooks, this is a little bit small, but you you guys are close to your screens. You can look at it. The things that tend to be these are a sampling of of different textbooks. Maybe you've used some of them. 
under consumption, you know, people just weren't buying enough in the 30s. That's why we had the depression. Income inequality, overproduction, debt, okay, all sorts of things, international trade. These are all mentioned in the different books. The big ones, the most cited ones being income inequality, stock market crash, tariffs, and international trade. I don't know of any uh, professional economist who would put income inequality as a cause of the Great Depression. Depending on what you mean by the stock market crash and trades, you could maybe make a case, okay? But really what most people point to since, and I'll go through this since the 60s, is the Federal Reserve policies, which only two textbooks even mention as a possible cause. So, so what caused the Great Depression? And this, we'll get back to Bernanke, but I, I think this is of first order importance if we're uh, going to talk about uh, uh, Bernanke's work. Well, economists since this guy, Milton Friedman, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 76. Again, I mentioned him as one of those, one of those being monetary history and theory. Okay, he wrote on particularly, uh, explicitly this topic. Okay, and he, he got the Nobel Prize for a lot of stuff. But he has a famous book uh, with Anna Schwartz, 1963, called A Monetary History of the United States, 1867 to 1960. 100 years or so of monetary history. And they go through painstakingly in detail, you know, what do we know about, about the monetary history of the U.S.? And their central argument is that it was policy errors by the Fed. The reason that the Great Depression turned into the Great Depression was the Fed messed up, okay? Not that it couldn't have done anything, not that it was like, you know, it was a chance thing. No, the Fed knew what to do, the Fed messed up, okay? And if, you know, if we can dig into exactly what that means, but what it means for them is allowing the money supply to collapse. They look at M2 uh, as a measure of money supply and household balance sheets. So the M2, I, I forget which aggregates are always which. I, when I teach principles of macro, I always need to look it up again. This is uh, checkings and savings. Cash on hand, checkings, savings deposits, uh, money market orders, basically money. And also household balance sheets, you know, what position they are. So the big part of the depression was uh, 19, the, the first drop was uh, 1929 or so. This times with the stock market crash, so a lot of people seem to think that matters. They call this the great contraction. And they don't mean the output contraction. They're telling the money supply contraction. The amount of money in society fell by a third over this few year period. Okay, just imagine that today. The amount of money that, let's, let's do the opposite of this. So, so in economics, we talk about helicopter drops. A helicopter drop is Imagine we gave everyone money. We just flew over society and we you know, threw it out of helicopters. Let's do the opposite of that. Let's do a helicopter vacuum. However much money you have in the bank, let's suck up a third of it. However much money uh, you have in your, under your bed, let's suck up a third of it. We can imagine that you're going to panic. You're going to do things differently. It's a, it's a major uh, policy blunder to allow this to happen. It didn't have to happen. We can, you know, why it happened, we can dig into that, but it didn't have to happen according to, to Friedman and Schwartz. Later, the Depression kind of has two depression, two recessions. We have the 29 one, and then we have 30, uh, 37, 38. Again, they messed up later in the recession and, and, and allowed the money supply to collapse. So at the forefront is not, not going back to the history textbook, not under consumption. It wasn't because people weren't buying enough. It wasn't overproduction in the in the twenties. You know, people were producing too much frivolous stuff. Your uh, uh, Great Gatsby type of story. It's Federal Reserve policy. This is Friedman and Schwartz. This is a talk about the Nobel Prize this year. Why does it matter? Well, Bernanke basically agrees, and for our purposes, I think that that's enough. He agrees with that story. He fleshed out details, which I'll talk a little bit about, but it's. The, at the end of the day, what matters is, is monetary policy. And famously, at Milton Friedman's uh, 90th birthday at the University of Chicago, he said, I'd like, to, I'd like to say to Milton and Anna, okay, regarding the Great Depression, you are right. We, the Federal Reserve, he's at the Fed now, 2002, he just got appointed to the Fed. We did it. We're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. Okay. 
putting all this emphasis that the the at a policy level, the Friedman Schwartz story, okay, is the way Bernanke saw the Great Depression. Okay. Now just agreeing with a previous Nobel Prize winner doesn't get you a Nobel Prize. I mean, I agree with Friedman more or less. I, I'm not gonna get a Nobel Prize. Okay, so he 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 put a little more substance on it. Okay. In particular, the most uh, cited paper of his is this 1983 AER called The Non-Monetary Effects of the Financial Crisis and the Propagation of the Great Depression. Non-monetary is a little bit confusing. I thought, I thought he was going to agree with uh, uh, Freeman. I, he calls it non-monetary. It's banking. I would still call that monetary. I don't know. But he used non-monetary to distinguish the focus on the money supply from banking. He focused on banks. Oops, I forgot I did this slide that way. Uh, erase that. Okay. So, what is Bernanke's argument? Banks intermediate between lenders and borrowers. People have money that they don't want to hold under their mattress and they'd like to earn a return. Those are possible lenders. Borrowers are people who have something in the future they think is going to be valuable, but they don't have the money to make it happen. Okay, borrowers, investors. To go in between them, they have to establish some sort of credit, but that's costly. In Bernanke's words, the cost of credit intermediation, the way to bring money from lenders, give it to borrowers and make sure everything's okay, okay, is a real cost. You have to figure out who's a good, who's a good person to borrow to. You don't have to look so much on the lending side. But you have to figure out what's good investments. You know, To run a bank, to make loans as a bank, you have to put in work. It's not just shuffling money around, okay? Although that's kind of a, a common story of how banking works. You don't know yet. Is this a good investment? After uh, after college, I worked for a, a manufacturing company that built power distribution. So, so you had a um, uh, a big event. You know all the stuff connected to the generator. We would sit down with the bank. And go through our financials, like sit down like you would go with your students through an assignment. These bankers are making a little bit of money. They have to sit down. It takes work to figure out, is this a good investment? We want, you know, $2 million to add this new line. That's costly. Okay. The Bernanke story is that the contraction of banking activity, this drop in the money supply. So it's, it's related to Friedman and Schwartz point. It broke this channel of credit. Okay, the lending that was going out, uh, the, you know, the savings that that lenders are willing to do, and the investing that borrow, borrowers are going to do. Okay, and because bank relationships are difficult to replace, you know, one bank goes under, a bank fails. I can't just go to the next bank down the road and get get a uh, get a uh, a loan. Going back to my my story from after college, right? We had built up. Not me. I wasn't there that long, but the company had built up over 20 years a track record of paying back their loans. And yes, they could show we could show that to the next bank. But if our local Minnesota bank wasn't, you know, they went under, it'd be really tough. And so what Bernanke did was was to quantify this channel. It wasn't to propose the channel. The channel is kind of novel. He he took it from a paper by um I forget who he got the model from. He, he, it's, he fleshed out a, a model from, from someone else. And what he asked is, is this channel, there's a collapse in the banking supply, some banks go under, that just disrupts the whole credit system. Is that big enough to generate the, out, the downfall in real output, downfall in GDP that we observe in the Great Depression? And Bernanke says yes. Okay. Big regression table, you know, uh, trying to figure these things out. Okay. That is quantitatively big enough to do that because that's the fundamental. It's a, at the end of the day, there's this, there's a weird link between banking and the real sector. You know, the actual firms that are producing stuff. Um, you know, there's the big question is how can just banking mess up this thing? Is purely financial. You know, if a bunch of banks go under, why does anyone lose their jobs? I mean, your firm is still producing stuff. Why Why do we need to lose a job? You know, the question is, 
how tight can we make that connection? Can we make it big enough to generate that Bernanke says yes? Okay. And more generally, that's one paper, an important one, an important quantification one. Uh, Bernanke's work really focused on the role of credit. And we'll talk a lot more about credit when we get to uh, Diamond and Dibvig. This idea that you know loans are a little bit more complicated than just uh, you know I give you money. There's we need a there's cost of intermediation. There's uh, room for uncertainty. It's a difficult thing. I linked to a few others in the in the newsletter uh, that Tara was talking about. I'll, I'll have a link at the end of the slides. One paper that's from the Journal of Economic Perspectives, which is a journal I'll plug. It's it's geared more towards. Uh, it, I would say I would say most of the papers are geared towards uh, upper level undergrads, but some, if you're searching through, some of them I I, I think are, I use them in you know principles of micro you know uh, first year first semester stuff. So this is a journal that if you don't know about and looking for more resources, besides the wonderful things. Uh, uh, that you get from Tara, Bernanke and, and Gertler have a paper there. Okay. So that's Bernanke. Again, going back, lots of different stuff um, from his work. The big takeaway is that finance matters, that credit matters, and it matters quantitatively. And this is the hard, this part that's kind of hard to get across. Um, one is I'm not a, a, a quantitative macro guy. Uh, but to just in a talk like this, quantitatively, it matters enough to generate these. Things. Okay. So that's Bernanke. That's one side that teaches us about banking. Um, where are we at? Okay. Good, good timing. So Diamond Dibvig. I made a joke, a terrible joke that uh, in, I guess it's so bad that I'll repeat it. You know, it's always in econ, it's always Diamond Dibvig. It's like it's like one person's name, like parents that just hyphenated their kids' names, right? The mom is Diamond, the dad is Dibvig, kids are Diamond Dibvig. That's how economists refer to this model. And I'm not talking. I'm going to talk about a model, one particular model worthy of a Nobel Prize. I think it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, so within banking, a few things about banks. Well, banks, like any other business, they have assets, they have liabilities. Okay. If it, the bank, could pay off all its creditors once its assets mature, you know, it's got things that are, it's promised to get paid back, uh, you know, in the future. If it could pay all those off, we could call this bank solvent. It has, if we just let things play out, the mortgage payments coming in, the assets it has that it's collecting money on, those assets are enough to pay off the debts. It's in a good financial position. In the same way that a, a firm uh, that has you know a bunch more assets and debts, they're in a good financial position. The flip side is insolvent banks. Okay, banks sometimes their 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 liabilities are more than their assets. They're holding a bunch of mortgages. This is two thousand eight. They're holding a bunch of mortgages. The value of those mortgages drops. Now their liabilities are where their assets. They're insolvent. Okay, and they quote unquote should go under. Okay, let's ignore all the other. They're just, they're not a net worth. They have negative net worth. Their liabilities are more than their assets they should go under. Okay? Just like any other should. Don't need to get into that. Banks have a separate, you know, other firms have it too, but banks really have a separate thing, which is about liquidity. If a bank, yes, it's in a good financial position in the long run, but it may not just today, it may not have enough money to pay back its obligations, particularly we're going to think of when depositors come back and they withdraw their cash. They're, you know, if we'd step back from the position and just like, you know, be patient, depositors, you'll get your money back, no worries. Okay. They're in a good solvent position, but today they just don't have enough money on hand. Somebody forgot it at the physical bank office, you know, at that, uh, 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 you know, at that branch, they didn't, they didn't leave enough money in the vault. Okay. That's illiquid. And this is an issue for banks. It's, a, it's an issue for all firms. It's really an issue for banks because of the nature of the business. Banks borrow short, short term. They, they take in deposits, okay, which they're borrowing from depositors. 
Okay, that at any moment somebody could come and take, could ask for it back, and they lend out long term. Okay, and this disconnect between the, the, the positive it has it's the investments it's making mean that it's susceptible for it to be illiquid, okay, in a way that, yes, you know, a, a, a manufacturing plant may not have enough money on hand, uh, but it's not quite the same thing as a bank. It's kind of inherent in the bank, bank, okay? And that leaves them vulnerable to runs. And I'll talk a little bit about this. So bank runs is what the Diamond Divvig model is about. It's a benchmark model of bank runs. It's so important. It's got its own Wikipedia page. That's pretty cool. Uh, I have a lot of models I built. Guess how many have Wikipedia pages? Okay. This is this is where I would also hear zero laughs from my undergrads. Uh, but I, now I really hear zero laughs, and, and so it's a little bit jarring. Okay, I want to leave enough time for questions, so we're going to go through this quick. So bank runs, okay? The fundamental tension is sound, solvent banks, banks that have enough money, they're, and they've made good investments, they can still be subject to bank runs, okay? And the diamond Diffig model shows how this is possible. And they... They assume that the bank's investments are riskless. They're going to get paid back. There's no issues. We know that they're solvent. Wait a little bit. They're going to make some money. Okay. So what's the model? It has three important uh, elements. First is that they're make banks are making or have the option to make long run investments, which means two periods. Okay, in two years from now, things that are going to pay off, but they can't. Once they've invested the money, they can't pull it back. Or at least it's it'd be costly to try to recover that money. They lent it out to a firm that you know built a bunch, built a factory. The factory doesn't have money today, but tomorrow it will. Investors, okay, people who are making, you know, borrowing this money, they're subject to what are called shocks. Out of nowhere, they need money. That's the second part. The third part is people have beliefs about when these withdrawals are going to come. Okay, both the the people making the withdrawals, I don't know why it keeps clicking forward. Okay, but the bank is too. They 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 are wondering when these withdrawals are going to come. So, banks come in. They serve a role where they intermediate. Okay, they allow investments in long term projects, and they provide liquidity for the people who need liquidity today in the form of say checking account. Okay. And if everyone knew when these withdrawals are going to happen, you know, Tara's coming on Monday to get her money out. I'm coming on Tuesday. Tina's coming on Wednesday. The bank has enough money. Money, you know, Monday I have 100 bucks on hand. Tuesday I have 300 bucks, whatever. The problem is we don't know. These, there are these shocks. Okay. So the bank may not have enough cash on hand. And anticipating that the bank tomorrow may not have enough cash on hand. What do savers want to do? They want to take it out today. And so their beliefs about what's going to happen matter. And they matter in a self-fulfilling way. So there's a good outcome where savers in, in this model, there's a good equilibrium where savers and borrowers go about their life. But there's a bad equilibrium. Worrying that the bank may not in the future be holding enough cash. I get worried and I say, I'm not going to leave my cash in the bank. You know, I don't want to be the last person there. And so there might be these runs on banks. Okay. And so to, to think about this in the context of, of you know, that, that banks can be in a good situation and banks can be in a bad situation, that's not that difficult. What's a little bit more costly is kind of tying it together in a way that's quote unquote rational. You know, how, how do people properly anticipating the risks of a run, how do they, they, deal with that. And so the way that we can think about it is there are multiple equilibrium, there are multiple outcomes that are possible. And because of that, people can switch between the good outcome and the bad outcome for kind of meaningless things. Let me try to explain what I mean. Let me imagine a game, which I'm going to call a driving game. Everyone driving on the right-hand side of the road is an equilibrium. You drive on the right-hand side, I drive on the right-hand side, we pass each other, everyone's safe, wonderful. You driving on the right-hand side, me driving on the left-hand side, we crash, not an equilibrium, not a good outcome. But in the same sense, driving on the left-hand side could be an equilibrium, 
there's nothing, you know, if I drive on the left, you drive on the left, great. And here's where beliefs matter. If I knew, I'm in the U.S. today, but I knew that tomorrow everyone was going to drive on the left-hand side, I would want to. I flipped it around. If you knew, you would want to. If you thought that on odd days we drive on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we would follow that. It's self-fulfilling in this way. Whatever people believe is what's going to happen. Okay? So unlike the driving game where it's kind of right-hand side, left-hand side doesn't really matter, there's a good outcome and a bad outcome. And just because of people's beliefs, we can alternate between them. Things are good one day. There's a sunspot. The, 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 uh, the sun looks a little bit different. Boom, everything switches. And what Diamond and Divvig show, we'll get into a little bit details, is that if we, if we risk share, okay, uh, in a proper way, at least uh, uh, we can prevent these runs. Okay, what does that mean? Suppose there's a bunch of banks doing this now, and we all come together and say, okay, if Bank A experiences a run, we'll, pay, we'll, we'll fill in and, and pay whatever needs to happen. This looks like deposit insurance. We can get into details of whether it is. It looks like the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And if, if there's no possibility that a particular bank is going to be insolvent, no runs occur, and the deposit insurance doesn't have to pay anything out because each bank's going to have it. And so we can kind of back, we can, with a proper risk-sharing agreement, you know, a way of... of, of uh, of bundling our, our risks together, we can stop these runs. Okay. So that's the model. It's a, it's a, it's a stylized model. I didn't go into the math. I don't, I don't think it's important. I think what is important is the way we think about this within economics. I love models. My training is as an economic theorist. I build models in, in my, for my job. That's what I do. But is this reality? Is this the way banking works? Uh, table here, not so clear. Everyone, including the Nobel Prize Committee, points to things like It's a Wonderful Life and Mary Poppins, these movies that capture bank runs, where this idea that, I forget, I should, I've should i taught this enough times in, in Principles of Macro, the, the main character needs to withdraw money, there's a run on the bank, oh, he can't get his money out. Are real bank runs like this? Are banks like this? The system, the simple model that Diamond did figure, I didn't go into, are they like that? Uh, economic historian, monetary historian, I, I trust very much. George Sheldon argues, no. I'll, again, I'll have links to stuff that you can, you can read on this. What I think is important, what I think that's hard to get across is that in economics, this is going to be a little bit weird, it's not always necessary for things to be quote unquote true. I argue that Diamond and Digvig they gave people tools. And so for the last few minutes here, I wanna talk about the role of these sorts of tools within economics. So I'm gonna call this a benchmark model. Economists value benchmark models that they can build off of. Supply and demand is a benchmark model. It's super simple. We have a downward sloping demand curve an upward sloping supply curve. From there, we can complicate things, but we'll start there, let's make life simple. I'm going to argue that many Nobel Prize win winners, uh, um, many Nobel Prize winners, are for developing benchmark models. Arrow and Debru, two Nobel Prize winners in separate years, developed general equilibrium models. Robert Solo, this one's a little bit more complicated, uh, developed growth models. Growth where technology doesn't play any role. That's silly. Clearly, technology plays a role in economic growth, but Solo doesn't have that in there. Okay. Krugman, uh, which you maybe know from the New York Times, same thing. Uh, I want to leave a, a, a few minutes for questions, so I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean by a benchmark model. So Akerlof, uh, interesting connection. George Akerlof, uh, Nobel Prize in 2001. Uh, his wife, Janet Yellen, was the Fed chair after Bernanke and before our current one, Jerome Powell. He has this market for lemons paper. Here's the idea. Good cars are worth $10,000. Bad cars are worth $2,000 or lemons. Okay. Sellers don't know which one. It, uh, sorry. So sellers know if they have a good car or a bad car. Buyers don't. Now, suppose it's a 50-50 chance. I could, you know, I come up to a, a person selling their car. Uh, 
I don't know. I'm risk neutral. Well, I'll split the difference. I'm willing to pay. If I've done my math right, that's halfway in between 10,000 and 2,000. Okay. But if I'm willing to pay $6,000, no good cars are going to sell. Why would anyone sell a $10,000 car for $6,000? And so knowing that I'm only willing to pay $6,000, only the lemons will sell. Knowing only the lemons will sell, I'm not willing to pay $6,000. I'm only willing to pay $2,000. This market unravels. Okay. Classic example of how asymmetric information affects markets. Is the market for lemons true? Well, I see people buying, selling cars every day. I want to buy a car. I'm going to buy a used car. Don't have money to buy a new car. I'm going to buy a used car. So that would mean that the model is wrong if you're just thinking about how it works. But I think what Akerlof is doing and Diamond did big as well is they're highlighting something true about some markets, right? There's something about the used car market and I approach it differently because I don't know, I don't know cars that well, okay? I don't know whether it's a good one or a bad one. So I do things like I go to a dealership instead of buying off of Facebook. What Akerlof really was able to do and why people keep going back to it again and again is they're, he was able to distill a mechanism that others could build off of. And that's what Diamond Didvig is. Diamond Didvig was a simple model about how self-fulfilling, uh, the self-fulfilling concerns could generate bank runs I don't care if it captures real banks in terms of like whether it's valuable. It's valuable because it's a simple thing we can build with. Okay. So wrap up three eminent deserving economists. I divided between Bernanke and Diamond Dibvig. Uh, Bernanke is much more applied, fleshed out our monetary understanding, especially of the Great Depression, but of monetary policy more generally. Diamond Dibvig, foundational theories, theory, especially one of them uh, for how, how to think about banking, how to think about bank runs. I wrote a Twitter thread on this, uh, could have saved you uh, the, the the 50 minutes of this talk. There's a link to that as well. Uh, oops, I wrote a, a newsletter on this. I have a, just to shamelessly plug, I have a newsletter uh, that I write every week, alternate between me and Josh Hendrickson called Economic Forces. I encourage you to check it out. In particular, I have a post about using economic forces in the classroom. Now, I, this is geared more towards uh, undergrads. That's what I teach and what, what Josh teaches as well. But hopefully you can find something interesting in there. Uh, I encourage you to subscribe. I encourage you to pass it on to your students. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions.